Hello everyone and welcome to Slash Film Daily for Monday, June 12th, 2021. On today's episode of the show, we're going to be talking about the latest film and TV news. My name is Ben Pearson, I'm the senior writer at SlashFilm.com, and I'm joined on today's episode by Slash Film Weekend Editor Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. And writer Y. Chern Bui. Hey everyone. All right, let's jump right into the news today. HT, Knives Out 2 has added a new cast member. Yes, and she's going to be trading her swords for some knives, some different shop objects. Uh, This is Jessica Hennick of Game of Thrones, Star Wars, and Iron Fist fame. She is the latest cast member to join Ryan Johnson's Knives Out sequel, joining the likes of Daniel Craig, Kate Hudson, Leslie Odom Jr., Catherine Hahn, Dave Bautista, Janelle Monae, Edward Norton, and most recently an actress named um, Madeline Klein. So things were kind of... In a lull, as far as Knives Out casting news, no one really knew who Madeline Klein was unless you watched Outer Banks, which apparently is in season two of on Netflix. But uh, I think we're all pretty excited about Jessica, Jessica Hennick. She is a rising star in every sense of the word. She's uh, you know, been in some great franchises and sold on the show in Iron Fist, and she's going to be one of the leads in the new Matrix sequel. And is currently filming The Gray Man opposite Ryan Gosling and Chris Evans. So I'm pretty excited to see her uh, join Knives Out too. Yeah, and as usual, we don't know you know anything about what kind of character she's going to be playing or anything like that. And I guess she's just going to be added to the list of suspects there. But um, I-, I loved your suggestion, HT, that uh, in the the article that you wrote about. Um, you know, we've been talking about how we really want to see Kelly Murray Tran in this movie. Yes. Um, she has not been announced as part of the cast, but because she's worked with Johnson before, we're sort of like, you know, we have our fingers crossed that maybe she'll be a late addition to this film. And you speculated in your piece or sort of suggested rather that um, that Jessica Henwick and, and Kelly Murray Tran could play sisters in this movie because they did the same thing in uh, Star Wars The Last Jedi, which Ryan Johnson wrote and directed. Actually, yeah. Page, uh, uh, it was Veronica No who played. Oh, um, it was. I'm sorry. Okay, I yeah. messed up. I'm, I missed that person. Henrik was was in Star Wars. She was just in. She was a um, what an X wing fighter pilot or something yes. in, in yeah, she's one Force of the Awakens. X-wing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got my people mixed up there. Um. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, that would be cool. Uh, regardless, even if if she and Kelly Marie Tran uh, have not shared the screen together before uh, in that movie, maybe they could play sisters in uh, in Knives Out too. That'd be pretty rad. Here's hoping. Yeah. Um. All right, Brad. So. Uh, the Book of Boba Fett is, um, I think, the next live-action Star Wars show that's coming to Disney Plus. Is that correct? The the new season, uh, or I guess the first season of the Book of Boba Fett, is that 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 is correct? Yeah, it's uh, it'll be it'll take place in like the same time period of the Mandalorian, and then Mandalorian season three is coming after the Book of Boba Fett. Okay, so there's some new uh, Book of Boba Fett news here. Why don't you fill us in about that? Indeed. Um, so we've been wondering exactly uh, how the Book of Boba Fett is going to play out. We got some kind of hint of it uh, at the end of The Mandalorian Season 2 when Boba Fett uh, marched into Jabba's palace uh, and killed Bib Fortuna, who had taken over uh, from the deceased crime lord in Return of the Jedi. Uh, he was joined by Fennec Shand um, in Jabba's palace, and it was clear that Boba Fett was going to Uh, be taking over this criminal underworld uh, on Tatooine. And now we have an idea of what else we'll see in this series because uh, Tamara Morrison uh, confirmed that there will be some flashbacks that will fill in the gaps of Boba Fett's past. Um, He said, uh, quote, "Uh, we can't say too much, but we're going to see his past and where he's been since the Empire Strikes Back. Somebody pointed out he's been kind of stuck in this one place, and now the time to actually go back in time and check out his journey and find out more about him. So uh, that's pretty cool, I suppose. Um, I I think one of the coolest things like about Boba Fett was the mystery about him. So mm-hmm. I hope that this isn't going to be something where it like digs into his origin and more so just explains what's what's been happening since the Empire Strikes Back because. I, I don't think we need to do much more origin story uh, exploration uh, in Star Wars. Um, I don't know about how, how you feel about that, but yeah, I'm I'm certainly right there with you uh, in that regard. And like to me, um, Star Wars does not seem to be 
uh, a franchise that um, traffics very often in flashbacks. I mean, obviously there have been shows that have gone backwards in the timeline and obviously the prequels did this, you know, most famously um, gone back before and sort of explored other storylines. But once a character has been introduced, it seems rare. And Brad, you're a much bigger Star Wars fan than I am. So please correct me if I'm wrong here, but it, it seems rare that once a character has been uh, introduced, that you know, within a show or movie, they'll go backwards and flashback and and explore, you know, sort of um, parts of that character's backstory. So this seems like a, uh, I mean, I I don't know. I feel like there might be a way to to do this where you just continue to plow forward and like fill in those gaps with dialogue and things like that. But what do you think about the the idea of like literally flashing back and seeing what happened to Boba Fett instead of just hearing about it? Um, when it comes to Boba Fett, I feel like I'm fine with it because a lot of time has passed uh, since we last saw Boba Fett in Return of the Jedi. We're, ta- we're, you know, we're talking years here since that's when The Mandalorian takes place. So there's a lot of gaps to fill in. So I don't mind the flashbacks too much. Um, I just hope that it's, I don't know, that it's it's worth it. Um, and I'm sure, you know, Favreau and Filoni and also Robert Rodriguez, who is executive producing uh, and is also confirmed to uh, direct several episodes of the Book of Boba Fett. Um, I think that they they know what they're doing with the character. And I just hope that it's something uh, interesting because, yeah, the, the the most flashing back we've done have been, like you said, you know, the prequels and then also Solo, a Star Wars story, which was entirely a flashback origin story of where Han Solo came from. And then, uh, you know, I guess I guess you could say the same thing about Rogue One since it takes place before Star Wars New Hope. But that also kind of worked on its own as just like a story that took place between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope. I know the TV shows have been a little little more forgiving as far as having uh, flashbacks to certain moments and things like that, but not necessarily, you know, fully fleshing out characters or providing, you know, deep looks back at, you know, a character's uh, right. his- history and things like that. Yeah, you see like a little bit of uh, of the Mandalorian, you know, like his his childhood in the first season, if I remember correctly, like little flashes of what happened to him and stuff like that. But yeah, this this seems like it's going to be much, you know, more like a much deeper exploration there. So um, yeah, I'm curious to see how Star Wars fans will react to this. Uh, and I think you said the Book of Boba Fett comes out in December. Is that right? Yeah, December of this year is when it's expected. Cool. All right, Uh, HT, tell me about um, F9. I mean, you've, you've, uh, I think, spoken a little bit about the movie before on uh, previous episodes of the podcast, but uh, you recently had the chance to interview uh, Justin Lin, right? So um, how did that interview go, and what did he uh, tell you that you want to talk about here today? The interview went great. Uh, He was great to speak to, and I wanted to ask him specifically about Justice for Han, uh, because that was, Han was a character that he created and brought into the Fast and Furious franchise, and um, that he brings back with F9, which he returns to direct after uh, several years away from the Fast and Furious franchise. The last movie he directed was in 2013, Fast and Furious 6. So um, the full interview uh, with Justin Lin, you can see soon on the site. I don't think we've published the full thing yet, but I've published little pieces of it, one of which uh, is specifically about Justice for Han and how the Justice for Han internet campaign actually inspired Justin Lin to bring Han back from the dead. He doesn't have just a thing for bringing characters back from the dead. That's not his whole deal. <laughs> he, he wanted to let me let everyone know that. <laughs> um, so he, to- he talked about how he actually wasn't aware of um, what happened with Han and Han's killer Deckard Shaw after he had left the franchise um, until someone had asked him at a Better Luck Tomorrow anniversary Q&A what he felt about Justice for Han. And he said, what's Justice for Han? And he learned about what the what transpired after um, Fate of the Furious and when Deckard Shaw is basically just kind of forgiven and welcome into the family after mm-hmm. killing Han. And, and he said, um, when I found out, I was baffled. But if anything, I maybe was a little hurt. I think he was such a beloved character. The way he was treated, it was almost like he was just dismissed. And I really appreciated the social media uproar. So I think the idea of bringing him back to me is not justice. I feel how we treat his character going forward to me. That is justice. And I give the fans 100% credit because I came back came back not for that reason. I came back for the explanation to the Jacob. But now looking back, I feel fortunate because everything that happened, I now get the gift of working, getting to work with Han again. So basically, if it weren't for the Justice for Han social media campaign, Han wouldn't have come back. 
Man, that's really cool. And the Jacob that you mentioned there is the John Cena's character, just in case anybody happens to be confused by that. Yes, it's not um, our Jacob. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, man, that's yeah, that's really cool. And I, I love the um, the reframing of uh, of justice there. Like you know, fans have been using that term as you laid out, like uh, in in terms of you know, bring this character back. And I, I love that um, Justin Lin is is saying you know, it's not just the just the bringing him back, but it's the the what we do with him that really matters. So. Um, that's very cool. I can't, cannot wait to see this movie. I'm so jealous of you that, that you saw it and had a chance to speak with Justin. And Lund, I, so. I will say, not, not complete spoilers, but I'm sure someone will yell at me for spoiling. But uh, if you are a fan of Justice for Han, stick around till the end credits of Ooh. F9. Okay. All right. Excellent. Um, all right. So let's talk about our last story today, which was a, uh, a logo video for Spider-Man No Way Home. This is... Um, <laughs> This is how slow the news is today, guys. So we're talking about a uh, a logo video. So Sony Pictures Argentina tweeted and then deleted a glitching logo animation for Spider-Man No Way Home, which is the the upcoming, um, I guess it's the third uh, Spider-Man movie in the, the Tom Holland series. And uh, this, you know, it, it just basically looks like a normal title treatment, um, you know, black background, just the text right there. But then at the very end of this video, it glitches a little bit. And uh, the glitch is very, very reminiscent of the sort of glitching that we saw throughout Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which uh, came out in 2018, animated movie. Everybody listening to this probably knows all about it by now. We talked about it a ton on this podcast before. Um, I don't know about you guys, but you know, we've known for months that um, Spider-Man No Way Home would feature characters from other like non-Marvel Studios movies. Alfred Molina is coming back to play Doc Ock from Spider-Man 2, and... Uh, Jamie Foxx is coming back to play Electro from The Amazing Spider-Man 2, for example. But I don't know about you guys. I, I just sort of, sort of assumed that Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse would be just like a precursor to Marvel's live action uh, exploration of the multiverse. But if this uh, title um, treatment glitching in that same way is actually a nod to the idea that those you know characters from that movie or uh, characters from Spider-Man No Way Home could you know cross into that universe because this multiverse is being explored here. Um, if that actually is a, a real connection that's being teased here, um, I, I mean, I guess I just never really th- thought about that before. I never really considered that um, Marvel might actually, or Marvel and Sony might actually incorporate animated components into Spider-Man No Way Home. So, um, you know, assuming that that, uh, that that actually pans out or that is actually a, a connection that is really legitimately being teased here. What do you guys think of that? Brad, did, have you ever thought about that? Have you ever considered, you know, animated portions of Spider-Man No Way Home happening before? Uh, no, and I'm not considering it now either. I'm going to dump water on your little fire here because mm. I, I don't think that that's happening in the least. I think this is just their... Uh, it's probably just a little effect that they're using to just tease the general arrival of the multiverse as we'll see it in Spider-Man No Way Home. And I think it's just a coincidence that it shares some of the aesthetics because like there are only so many ways you can represent a glitch visually and it's usually with like that scrambled video kind of effect. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I feel like it's just a, a thing that they're throwing in there as a way of hinting that there's some you know scrambling about that's going to be happening in No Way Home. And I don't think that there'll be any crossover with Into the Spider-Verse at all. I mean, it's possible though, right? Because the, the whole thing is like, there's a multiverse and it's these, you know, universes that are running parallel. And like, if portals get opened up and Doc Ock from Spider-Man 2 can hop into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, who's to say that, uh, you know, uh, Doctor Strange won't show up in No Way Home and show Spider-Man, you know, a, a slideshow presentation of all these universes acting, you know, uh, moving forward concurrently. And one of them happens to be the Into the Spider-Verse universe where it's just a bunch of animated stuff right next to live action stuff you don't think it's possible it's it's possible in the same way that it's possible for me to get struck by lightning right now <laughs> um okay. all right fair enough Brad. but I really appreciate this i'm trying you know i'm throwing i'm, I'm twisting here and you're yeah. just like absolutely freaking not i love it's it, only Brad. it's only because i i think that Mar- it's it, that's something that I think totally fits, you know, the idea of the Marvel Comics multiverse. But I think when it comes to the movie multiverse, they it, they already have an uphill battle, probably trying to explain how the multiverse works to 
audiences already. You know, there's some prep with WandaVision and Loki, obviously, but I think some of this stuff's going to be somewhat confusing for general audiences. And so mm-hmm. the idea of suddenly throwing a Who Framed Roger Rabbit curveball into it and being like, oh, no, <laughs> cartoons can come to the real world too. Everyone's <laughs> going to be like, what's going on here, guys? <laughs> I just feel like, and you're probably right, Brad, just for the record, I think you're probably right. But I love the idea that they would be bold enough to do something like that. And I feel like this would be a good opportunity to do it, you know, like as as a way to visualize what exactly the multiverse is and just how wild things can get. Yeah, um, it would it would be very cool. I I would I would pick, I would love it if it was just like an aside kind of like in um in Wayne's World 2 when Wayne takes Garth over to that door in Stan Mikita's Donuts and there's a bunch of people training like in a James Bond movie <laughs> and Mike Myers is just like yeah, Garth's like, what are these guys for? He's like, nothing. I just always wanted to open a door where people being trained, you know, like, and it's like, like Dr. Strange opens up a portal and uh, Peter Parker's like, what's that? And he's like, ah, don't worry about it. Yeah. It's just like Spider-Man noir and, and the, uh, the pig one just like playing checkers or something like that. He His name is Spider-Ham. You show your Excuse some me. respect. Excuse me. You're absolutely right. Uh, HD, what do you make of this nonsense theory that I'm, I'm putting forth here? Do you think that there's any chance that we're going to see an animated, uh, clip or or character make its way into no way home oh i think it would be cool but uh i also think it's uh not quite as plausible as as i would hope maybe i feel like it would maybe change the whole tone of the thing because the only time we've seen these kind of hybrid animated live action things is in comedies and i feel like maybe marvels want to go or i guess it's marvel anymore i don't know uh <laughs> Marvel doesn't want to go in that direction. Mm. Sony doesn't want to go in that direction. Um, but I think it would be cool. You know, just push the push the limits, push the boundaries, have some fun with this. Yeah, yeah. I think all of us are looking forward to this movie, even if they're, you know, uh, even if my nonsense theory doesn't actually come true. I'm, I'm very curious to see, like, the full extent of how the multiverse is explored in uh, Spider-Man No Way Home, which, again, is another movie that comes out this year. Um right around the time as a uh, book of Boba Fett. This one comes out uh, December 17th, 2021. So um, yes, yeah, stay tuned for that. I'm sure we'll have much, much more in the future. So I think that's going to bring us to the end of today's episode of Slash Film Daily. You can find more about all of these stories that we mentioned on today's show at SlashFilm.com and linked inside the show notes of this episode. Slash Film Daily is published every weekday, bringing you the most exciting news from the world of movies and TV, as well as deeper dives into the great features you can find on the site. You can subscribe to the show on Apple, Google, Overcast, Spotify, all of the popular podcast apps, and send your feedback, questions, comments, and concerns to us at peter at slashfilm.com. Make sure to leave your name and general geographic location in case we mention your email on the air. Don't forget to rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Tell your friends, spread the word. Thank you all for listening, and we will talk to you tomorrow.